So your podcast, what it did for me was that it spoke so normally about a home birth and a hospital birth. And I think home birthers, maybe like myself included, can get very attached to the idea of a home birth being the best way to do something. And I don't think that's true, even after having it. The best way for a mom to give birth is the way that's going to give her the most peace in the moment. Getting pregnant and giving birth are two of the most exciting things you can ever hope to experience in this life. The moment you think you could be pregnant, you're frantically searching for all the best information, which is why you're here today. I'm Stephanie King, and with my many years of experience as a professional childbirth educator, doula, and lover of all things pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I'm here to make preparing for your birth enjoyable, empowering, and totally easy. Each week, I'll cover different topics, interview professionals, and get into the nitty-gritty birth stories from mamas just like you. And when you're ready for more, you can join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com, where I take you step-by-step through exactly how to prepare your mind, body, spirit, and partner for a birth you love. So let's get started. It's time. The My Essential Birth postpartum course is here. Whether you're pregnant, just got baby home, or weeks and months into postpartum, this is the course for you. No more wondering what's normal for your body postpartum, if baby's eating or pooping enough, or how to get a good latch. You now have an all-in-one resource where you can click a topic and get the answer. Learn more at myessentialbirth.com forward slash postpartum and add it onto the My Essential Birth course for even less when you bundle them at checkout. Already in the course? Check your student library and add the course for the same discount. I can't wait to support you on your postpartum journey. Our reviewer of the week is Cakes3054, and she says, late to the game. I am 35 weeks pregnant and just discovered this podcast last week. OMG, I have been binge listening and have learned so much already. You ladies are amazing, and I'm really hoping to get the birth I have envisioned this time around with my second. Thank you so much for all the information and all the tools you're providing to achieve our birth-related goals. Um, If you are here listening and you are also feeling like you are, quote, too late to the game because you are 35, 36 weeks, I promise you, you are not too late. There are so many things that you can do even within that small amount of time to get your mental state ready to go and even some prep for your body. So keep listening, keep following along, keep putting in the work. Every little bit of that is going to help and support you along the way. With me today, I have Martha. I am so excited that you are here. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and you guys, it is another birth story podcast. So here we go. Hi, I am Martha Hinnon. I am in Kentucky. I had uh, two home births. I found your podcast before the second. I'm a yoga teacher. I love plants. I have a little small business. I was just singing Kirtan before this started. (laughs) So that's the kind of person I am. I guess that's a good, a good description enough. I love it. Yes. And I'm just thank you for being here today because I'm really excited um, for another good birth story. So with that in mind, will you start us at the beginning? Tell me a little bit about your pregnancy, how those things went. If there's anything that popped up along the way, change of providers, anything like that. You kind of shared briefly that you had a home birth with your first. So even if you want to like touch on that experience and then dive into this pregnancy, that would be great. Yes, I will. They were very different. So the first, well, I will say I didn't know gender with either because that, that affects the ending to me. Um, But (laughs) the first one, let's see, the pregnancy was different. I had like no morning sickness and it ended up being a girl, which, you know, that's kind of opposite, but I had one provider. We don't have a lot of midwife options in this area. So there isn't a lot of choice there, which is you know, unfortunate, fine. They're very experienced, you know. Um, but I had a few midwife students in that first birth, which one of the students ended up being the midwife at my second birth. But with the first one, I, yes, did it at home. I was in an inflatable tub, which I did not want to repeat the second time because 
I did not have leverage enough to Mm. push on the sides. I birthed on my hands and knees. I had a cervical lip that the midwife had to put her finger in. And as I pushed during those pushing contractions, that was unpleasant if anybody else has had that happen. Um, She was born. I saw she was a girl, started hysterically laughing because I thought she was a boy the whole time. My husband (laughs) still remembers that being really an interesting emotion. And then uh, it was (laughs) the best, the funniest thing that happened immediately after Cora was born, I saw she was a girl, I'm laughing. And then in my own head, I didn't share this with anybody, but in my own head, I'm thinking, you know, I just went through a lot. I'm really tired. I definitely could have confused a little penis with a little vagina. So I'm going to check again. Right. And I (laughs) held her up again, confirmed little vagina. Okay. I wasn't, you know, I didn't hallucinate there. So, um, but I was so happy, happy about that. And uh, my water broke both times, um, which I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, because I definitely knew I was in labor, but also I hear, I don't know the difference, but I hear it makes your contractions a little bit stronger. Um, so the first one, I guess, was kind of kind of uneventful. Or I don't know. It's all a big event, but nothing, nothing yeah. really, really crazy happened. Um, just that it, my water broke at the beginning. It was a really long go. I labored a lot in the water with the first one um, in that inflatable tub and then also in my bathtub. Um, my contractions slowed down when the birth team arrived uh, greatly. I think I had... the like 20 something. My husband was so sweet. He was trying to write everything down. We had done a Lamaze class, you know, so he was really trying to, to differentiate between, um, active labor or, you know, like what the minutes were and, or how long the contractions were. And so he wrote them, wrote them all down. And I think I had, um, maybe like 20 something contractions in an hour. Like it was like Pitocin, you know? And, Hmm. um, when they get there though, everything slows down and knowing my daughter, she is very shy. And so I kind of get, I understand that now. Like she was like, wait, why are all these people here? What's going on? You know? So everything slowed down. But, um, anyway, so the second one, okay. This one I just had in April and, uh, it was a boy, which I didn't know until I came out. And that was okay, don't go into that birth story just yet because I want to walk through the pregnancy, oh, the pregnancy and all that stuff. But I do want right. to ask you about your your first birth and it being a home birth because you don't always find that to be the case. So I'm just curious how it came to be. Did you start with an OB and switch to a home birth midwife? Did you have people in your life that were like, just do home birth? How did that happen for you? I had no one in my life who was like, do a home birth. <laughs> I think that's significant. <laughs> I have always been kind of naturally minded. So the idea of doing things the most natural way, I wanted to birth the most physiologically natural way. And I understand that does not give some people peace. It gave me a lot of peace to do it that way. Um, And from the beginning, so I should say, I actually had a miscarriage before my, my first birth. So I found the midwife at that, that, very first pregnancy. I miscarried at eight weeks. And then, um, which I, yeah. And let me just say something about that. If anybody else has experienced that, um, I do not, I did not feel that that baby died. I felt like it was my, my daughter. She just left and came back. Like she was in a little bit of a hurry. So, you know, when we conceived, she was like, okay, I'm coming down. You know, my job was really stressful at the time. It was kind of bad timing. I ended up miscarrying and she just kind of left. And I remember speaking to her and saying, why did you leave? Like, why did you leave? You know, like everything was fine. And I miscarried like tissue, like it was working, like what's going on, you know? And then the next opportunity, my job had changed. I was working from home and she came back. So that's just a different perspective. I don't hear a lot. So maybe somebody, maybe somebody will like that. But anyway, so that's how I found the, the, the midwife the first time. And then uh, I did go to a doctor 13 weeks when, when, I, when I became pregnant that second time. He was very nice. It was a recommendation from the midwife, like, which doctor, which OB do you all recommend in the area? You know, so I go to him. He was very chill. 
um, like didn't make me get a pap smear in the visit, you know, very, uh, very nice guy. But, um, he told me I had to stay in the hospital for two days. Even if everything went great, I would have to stay in the hospital for two days. And I didn't like that. And I I didn't like the fluorescent lighting. That was kind of uncomfortable for me. Um, and so my intention was always to have the home birth. And then after that hospital visit or the appointment, I was just kind of like, yeah, I definitely, I definitely think I'm going to be more relaxed at home. Um, and I was, and I will revisit how I didn't have anybody telling me to have a home birth (laughs) because, um, my mother, basically every woman in my family had a C-section and I, the idea of birth was not a joyous experience. The stories that I hear, right. Um, my mother had an emergency C-section, uh, my brother, he was the first one, you know, he was in distress. She had to do this. Um, it was kind of scary for her, you know, and she never talked about birth pregnancy. She never talked about it in a good way. And so for me, I just decided no fear that first pregnancy. I just remember thinking no fear. There's no fear in this house about this. We're not having any fear surrounding the birth. Um, and that was not easy, but you know, it required a lot of faith in myself and reaching deep, deep back in my ancestry, you know, like obviously a woman in my past had a natural birth at some point. And so I believe in like your genes passed down information, right? And so somewhere in my body, there's, you know, some DNA that knows how to do this. And so I had to access that, but my husband was very supportive. Um, he had no idea it was even an option. He didn't know you could even have a baby in your bathroom, you know? And, uh, so yeah, nobody, Nobody, nobody was, was discouraging, but I didn't have anybody to really talk to either besides the midwife, you know, who had done this. So it was just a lot of, um, intention, you know, with that first one. I like that. Okay. So talk about this pregnancy then. So you have this wonderful experience with this home birth and and having that first baby. And now what is this pregnancy like for you? Second pregnancy. And I, I love it because I love moms hearing like second time around, like what they can expect or just relating with other people's experiences because it is so different once like the very first time you go through it and then kind of knowing where you're at the second time. Yeah. The, so the second one, very, very different, very different pregnancy. Um, I was sick for five months. <laughs> I, oh boy. I, I, I had, and maybe this matters, but I had lost like a significant amount of weight in between them. Um, I just got really, really small. I did this big, long fast. And I, I think that I don't really know if that made a difference or not, but it was a big event in between the two. So I was sick for five months. I was driving a lot for my job in the car two days a week, driving a lot. It was awful. I ended up quitting that job because I was just like, I'm too pregnant. I don't care about this. You know, and I talked to my husband about the finances and I was like, I would rather count pennies than have a paycheck right now. Like this is awful, you know, driving for this. So, but I did find your podcast driving back and forth. (laughs) So, So I'm binging it, like listening, you know, and the biggest difference though and this doesn't make any sense. And this is why I think like inherited birth trauma is a thing is, you know, I had had this home birth. It was a great experience. I was not traumatized, you know, and the second pregnancy, I had so much anxiety that I did not know where it was coming from. And, um, you think I had known, like I knew what to do that I'd have more, more confidence. And it wasn't that I didn't have confidence. It was just kind of like, I was scared something was going to go different. It was maybe like I had had such a good experience. I was afraid that wasn't going to happen again. And, um, I, so your podcast, what, what it did for me was that it spoke so normally about a home birth and a hospital birth. And I think home birthers, maybe like myself included, can get very attached to the idea of a home birth being the best way to do something. And I don't think that's true. Even after having it, even after doing it, I don't think that's true. I think the best way for a mom to give birth is the way that's going to give her the most peace in the moment. Um, 
and maybe for some people that is in a hospital setting, you know? So, um, but I was just so, so afraid of something going different. And I really forced myself to identify that core fear. Like, where is that coming from? Where is this anxiety coming from? Um, one thing I did actually was I switched providers in the middle, which is not common with a midwife. I had signed up with my first midwife and it just didn't seem, I'm not gonna say anything bad about her cause she's great. She's very knowledgeable, very, um, like calming, you know, but something just wasn't right. And I'll tell this story cause it's kind of fun. We had a Valentine's day reser- uh, reservation yet. Yeah. And so this baby was born in April. So I was like pretty far. This is in February. And it was a weird time, like five o'clock, like some weird, you know, kind of early for dinner on Valentine's Day. And I run into Jennifer, who was the midwife student at my first birth. Okay. She's at the table right next to me and I'm popping out pregnant. Right. She's like, Hey, I'm like, Hey, oh my gosh. And we kind of start talking, you know, and we left and I told my husband, I was like, there's a reason why we saw her. And, um, I, I was like, I want to, I'm going to switch over. So I go and meet with her and I'm like, Hey, would you even do this? You know? And she's like, yeah, totally. So, and I had to be bold and call the first midwife and be like, Hey, I'm switching. You know, that wasn't the most pleasant conversation. And then there was like some, we lost some money. I mean, that's just part of it. When you do the home birth, you know, you're writing checks and we did lose some money there, but I don't care. It was, it was the best decision for me to do. And, um, so, so I switched midwives and that was, that gave me a lot more peace. So if anybody feels that way, you know, be confident in in your own, your own self. But, uh, so I switched to Jennifer and I, so that was part of the anxiety. Right. And so then I'm like, what is this worst fear? Like, what is making me so nervous about birth? You know? And it was like, I don't want to end up in the hospital. I don't want to end up in the hospital. Like, you know, and, and I was like, well, why? why don't I want to end up in the hospital? You know? And then I think about my mom telling me these horror stories, not, not horror, sorry, but telling me these, you know, her birth experiences, which were not pleasant. And it really came down to the idea of powerlessness. That's what I was so afraid of was being powerless in this moment where I find pregnant women being the most powerful form of human. Right. And I was afraid that in this divine moment, my power would be taken from me. And so I'm listening to your podcast and what was giving me so many, so much peace was these, these birth stories of these women in this hospital setting, still maintaining their power. Right. So I faced that within myself thinking, okay, if this baby gets up, you know, crooked in there, I can't do this home birth. As long as it is my choice and my decision to do this C-section or do this epidural. Like I'm choosing to, no one's, no one is making me feel inadequate. Like you need to do this or you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna be able to birth this baby unless you do this. Like, no, no, no. As long as it is my, the power remains in my being and I'm not externalizing it, then the experience is what I'm going to want it to be. So, um, that was a big deal. I mean, I, it's, I guess saying it, maybe it doesn't, Cause it's in hindsight and it doesn't seem like it was so hard, but that was a big, that's when I think of when I think of this pregnancy is really facing like my fears, um, surrounding how I wanted my birth experience to go. And let's see, another fear was my water was going to break again. And it did. Uh, but I did everything I could. I read every medical study. I ate so much vitamin C and collagen. It didn't work. Uh, my water just breaks at the beginning, but that wasn't, that wasn't so bad. Um, so that's the pregnancy, basically. So was it pretty like straightforward then? You didn't have any like, like, did you test positive for GBS? Did you have any issues with hypertension, gestational diabetes, um, anything like that? I had low iron um, and Jennifer. So Tracy was, oops, well, I said her name. Ah, the first midwife wasn't that worried about it, um, but it was making me nervous. And uh, Jennifer was very serious about it. And she checked my blood just like every other week. Like, if you don't get it up to this, you're going to risk out, you know. And so I was very vigilant getting my iron up. And I did. And it was fine. And it was good because jumping to the end, I bled, I bled more at the, at, the, at the end with the second one. So it was really good that I, that I got that iron up. I, how did you, if you don't mind me asking, how did you get that iron up? 
because this is a conversation that I think a lot of moms have and specific to having home births and needing to be in certain levels to safely give birth at home. Um, what did you do? So specifically, I took Hemaplex, which is a supplement you can just get on Amazon. And it was great. It didn't give me any like sickness or, or anything weird. You know, I also, and this is where it gets a little weird. I also took um, organ supplements. So I don't think that's weird at all. This is what I recommend. Okay. So Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm really into that. So I was eating a lot. In my area, we have farms, you know, so it's easy for me to get local meat. And I can ask the farmer like, hey, I want the heart. I want the liver, you know. Um, so I was doing that, grinding it up. If anybody's grossed out by that, just grind it up and make tacos. You know, you really don't know the difference. Um, and then I was with also that, eating, uh, I'm just going to put a plug here because I, right. I've actually started taking myself beef liver organ supplements, but it, like the supplements, I am not grinding it myself and eating it my that way. So you can also take it freeze dried for those that are listening. Um, and if, if that is not for you, I mean, it's great. If you can stomach it, that's the best way, right? Like fresh, natural food is going to be the best way to get it. But if you can't, beef liver organs are awesome. And I'll actually put a link in the show notes. There's a company that I've been using and I have a 15% discount for that as well. Um, you guys can click that there. But I think that's huge that you're talking about that because this is something that a lot of women, it's like a. what's funny is like this was a thing back in the 50s, yeah. 60s, 20s, 30s, you know, all, all like yeah, back it then. Everyone, it, it was, was normal totally normal to eat liver, yeah. to eat, you know, yeah. the organs. And, and now it's like, we've, we've gotten away and, from it. It's so weird. Yeah, and, and right. Exactly. The desiccated though, like the organ supplements, it that kind of could be better because a lot of those are raw and then freeze right. dried. So you're kind of eating it in the raw form there. So that, I, I mean, arguably it could be better than cooking it, you know? And um, I won't say- I'm like, brand, whatever way you can get it in your body. Yeah, whatever way you can get it. <laughs> yes. I, so I found a, um, like beef liver. Yes, that's great. But I found a company that you can get like every body part. So I found one that was for women and it was uterus and like ovaries. Oh, interesting. Fallopian tubes. Yeah. So I was taking that. I think all that kind of worked together to get my iron up. But in my iron, my iron was, was great. She was like, I don't know how it got up. It got so fast or got up so high so fast, you know, yeah, and I'm that's like, how. Uh, I'm <laughs> you crazy did and I do yeah. crazy things. I take nutrition very seriously, which I, yeah. I didn't, I don't want, I could go on and on about nutrition, but those were big, big things in both my pregnancies. And yes, you need to eat good things. It's easier to find information on what you should eat. Right. But there's a lot that you should avoid. Like, I think part of the reason why my pregnancies went so well is because I was avoiding like inflammatory things, you know? So yes, eat the organs, but also don't eat things that are bad for you. Right. Like, yes, you're pregnant and you have cravings, but like try to get the healthier option. Anyway, I will not go on a tangent about <laughs> nutrition. It's one of my passions, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so yeah, my iron was low. So I had at the beginning, I convinced myself I had gestational diabetes. I did not. I was just having some weird sugar. Like my digestion was slow and I think it was affecting my blood sugar. But also anytime I had blood work, my sugar was really low. I like didn't eat sugar. That's the thing. Like the carbs I would eat would be like a banana. So I'm like, like bananas aren't going to give me gestational diabetes. So I was just, I was worried about that, but that ended up being like a non-issue at the end. Um, I was GBS positive with my first baby and my second one, I was negative. And I can tell you how I did that <laughs> maybe. Cause I know it's kind of like changes, but I found it, I made my own like probiotic blend and was like inserting it like a liquid. I was inserting it into my, um, you know, vagina. We're all, you know, familiar with that here, I guess. In the that's how I did. That's how I think I got my GBS because I read about it and it's just a bacteria, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, if I can introduce good bacteria into the area, then maybe I can cancel out the bad. That was what I did for that. And um, I ended up being negative. So any, um, there was nothing, I don't think there was anything else, anything else weird. Maybe ask me, it'll, it'll remind me. <laughs> no, like the other one would have been like, you know, broken back of waters. Um, uh, yeah. Both no, I can't think of, if there's nothing like popping off at you, then probably not. I am curious though about your prep work. So like you found the podcast, you're binge listening the podcast. Obviously you jumped into the birth course. I want to hear maybe you can tell us what time, like how pregnant you were when you decided to do that. And then how you and your birth partner work together 
on these things to prepare. And when you're talking about it, um, as much as you can get into those like nitty gritty details of how you prepared. Like I did this every day. I listened to this. I, you know, I was thinking about this. I physically did that. So, so the second birth was much more mental. I, um, I will say my first birth, I was very active, would not sit down. Like I'm so pregnant. I'm not pulling weeds, you know, it was very, very important to me. Just stay moving, stay moving. And, um, my daughter came out that way. (laughs) She's not a chill baby. Right. So the second one, I was intentionally going to relax more, hoping to create a more relaxed baby. And it kind of worked. But so the second time prep work, I read a lot of books. Um, birthing from within is one that I did. I did a, um, spiritual, no, what's it called? Enlightened pregnancy which was a, it's like Buddhist inspired, but you get like a nightly meditation where you're kind of connecting with the baby. There's a Buddhist belief where the spirit before the, before they're born, they're going through like a journey and you, you help them through that journey, um, spiritually. So that might be a little weird for some people, but I did that meditation every night. Um, and I did like a labyrinth meditation. So, um, like a, a, I have like a, a clay labyrinth and I would trace it with my finger thinking about the journey into birth. Right. So as you're nearing the end of your pregnancy, you're getting closer and closer to that, that birth space, which is a very, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a very distinct mental space that you find yourself in. And then of course, working your way out through the postpartum period and and imagining that process. My husband, um, he would rub my belly every night with my belly cream. And I did a dry brush massage, a dry, excuse me, dry brush massage every night. And he would do that um, for me. And then um, yoga. So I'm a yoga teacher and I did teach yoga up to like nine months through March I did. And um, it's with, it was with a mom's group and we, I taught a handstand class and I'm like upside down on the wall when I'm so pregnant and they're like, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm like, maybe maybe not, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Um, but lots of movement and I don't like just talking about the movement and even in yoga, people treat pregnant women like they're so fragile. If you twist this way, you're going to hurt yourself. And I just don't think that's the case. I think you need to really stretch out the front body to give the baby room to move. You know, if it feels good, do it. Like, don't be afraid. Your body is, is on like extra alert as far as protecting you. So you shouldn't be worried about that. Um, Day, okay. I like, I mean, I listen to your podcast daily. I, um, the movement. So, so I did the movements every day, like the three essential movements, you know, and those are like in yoga as well. Um, in yoga, squatting, like holding onto the counter, trying to, you know, not to tip over when you're in your squat. Ah, I practice my, uh, birth positions in the bathtub. So I mentioned the first time I was in an inflatable tub, And I distinctly remember being on my hands and knees and just not wanting to be on my hands and knees, but I was so tired. I could not be in a squat because the inflatable sides were giving too much. Like I didn't have anything to lean on. to support. Yes. And so the second one, we have a freestanding tub that was tall enough, you know, for me to be on my hands. And I'm also small um, to be on my hands and knees and, and my bottom covered. So I'd get in that tub and practice how I wanted to birth. Right. And I'd be like, okay, my husband would be in there with me. And I'm like, okay, so if I get it here, I can press on the, on this side and press my back against the other side, you know, like hypothesizing how I'm going to birth this baby in this, um, in this tub. So I think that was really helpful. And also I would just pee freely anywhere that I could to, to relax my pelvic floor. So obviously you pee in the toilet, but in the shower, just pee if you're taking a bath. Pee, your 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 body's so trained to only relax your pelvic floor on the toilet, right? And when you're in labor, you just need to be able to relax it wherever you may be. And so um I did that a lot. That was very intentional at the end, was just peeing any in it not on the toilet as often as I could, not just like around the house, but um <laughs> so towards the end, all that got a little more. Uh, rigid, you know, as far as keeping your routine, but I did a lot of that every day. Um, and I wasn't working. So I said, I hated my job driving. And I know that's like a, um, a, that not everybody has that, um, privilege, right. 
to not be working towards this, the end. And, um, I was able to, so I had some time and I just remember listening to, I remember doing laundry, doing all the baby laundry and listening to, to your podcast and, um, do while well, doing the, the best thing, you know, was the, um, like the movement for me because I was in my head so much the second pregnancy that making sure I was moving my body in the, in the right ways. And since I had a heads up, as far as I would already had a home birth, I kind of knew what, what movements I wanted to be doing. Um, yeah. And then his birth, his birth. So how he actually came out was much different and unexpected. If I can tell that part now. Or- yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's, that's a good like segue. Let's go ahead and start <laughs> with the birth. Take us from that first contraction all the okay. way through. <laughs> all right. First contraction. So wake up in the middle of the night with a gush. So it was 2 a.m. And it's just no question of what it is. Right. So I get up, I do my little Q-tip anyway. So, you know, the amniotic fluid Q-tip that like turns green or whatever. Okay. So I did that anyway. I knew I come, I go get my husband. Hey, my water broke. He's like, what? Um, I will say um, my first one, I, my water broke at 38. My second one, I was 39 and a half or 38 and a half and then 39 and a half. So I was a little early both times. Uh, But so, and they also tell you your first birth, your contraction time is cut in half with the second one right? That's what they told me. So the first one was like 18 hours. So I'm like, this is only gonna be nine. I'm gonna have this baby by morning, you know? So I told my husband, we're like getting ready. Cause with Cora, everything started so fast. Like, I mean, it was 30 minutes after my water broke. It's just back to back to back. Well, this time very, very slow entry. I mean, I don't think I really had contractions until maybe like five or 6 AM. And then I remember in the morning, my mom had come Um, and I was like sweeping the floor and like having these contractions and they just like, weren't that bad. And they were very sporadic, very far apart. And maybe that's normal for some people, but that's not how my first birth went. So I was kind of like, eh. So I call everyone in the morning, you know, midwife doula, Hey, you know, water broke. And, um, the midwife was like, I'd really love to have a daytime birth. And I was like, I got you. This baby is going to be born before the moon rises, you know? And then my doula was like, well, how do you feel? Do you want me to come over? I'm like, sure. Yeah. Come over. You know, it's not, nothing really crazy is happening, you know? <laughs> and so she did, she gets there at like 11 and, um, I was just like laboring in bed, peeing, peeing in my diaper, peeing freely in my diaper. Okay. Somehow that's important to me to express on this podcast is the peeing freely. So she, I, and this is something that I have never heard. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I have not heard this. This happened in both my births. It's like my transition is an emotional thing. So I have a handful of contractions that are timed like contractions. They last as long as like a physical contraction, right? But it's like a sob, like a sobbing feeling, like almost like a hyperventilation, like sobbing, crying, and then it goes away. So when that happened, my doula is like, okay, this is serious. We need to get, you know, we need to get the midwife here. And that was at like 11. And I was like, all right, I'm ready to go. You know? So then I get, um, things started getting more painful at that point. And I didn't have back labor. I just had it in the front, I guess, but you know, it kind of feels like it's on your whole body. So it's, a lot. It's a, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant, but I was in the tub in my bathtub for about two hours. Um, and it was what felt really good to me. So I'm in this hard sided tub and what felt good to me was pressing on one side with my arms and that would press my low back into the other side. So there was like pressure on both. And so, um, I keep switching. I'm sorry. My first birth, my husband and the doula had to do hip contractions, like or hip compressions with every contraction. And the second time, I think they maybe did one or two. Like he was bored, she was bored, you know. He's like, what do you know, what do you want me to do? I'm like, nothing, it's fine. Like everything's good. You know, I'm just in the tub. I did vocalize more how bad it hurt the second time. Like I was looking at my husband, I'm like, this is awful. This sucks. I don't want to do this right now, you know? And I'm just like, it, he's looking at me like nothing's happening. And that was something my doula and the midwife both told me both times is like, I guess the look on my face is very calm because I'm just worried about breathing and 
trying to relax every muscle in my body. And they, they don't, it doesn't look like what's happening inside of me is happening, you know, I guess, cause I look so peaceful, but I'm like, no, this is, it's awful. Like everything hurts, you know? So I am intuitively pushing, right? So I don't know if everyone listening here knows that, but when your body is ready to push, you don't have to try. It is just something that starts on its own. And that's how it was for me. Like you make your noises change. Like you're, you have to vocalize while you're pushing, I think, because it just helps, you know, um, it's a very like guttural kind of primal, primal noise. It's great. So that starts happening. I'm, I'm still in the tub and I'm in kind of like a seated position pushing and my midwife wanted to do a cervical check to see if I had a lip, right? They didn't do, I didn't do any cervical checks either time because I did not want to know if I was laboring for four hours and I was only a centimeter, I did not want to know because that was going to kill my mental game, right? Like I did no cervical checks until the very, very end she wanted to see if I had a cervical lip or not. And so at this point I'm pushing it, but it didn't feel like it was going anywhere. Like even in this moment, I'm like, this baby's never coming out. I'm never having this baby like ship me up to the hospital because this baby's just never going to come out. And I remember telling my midwife, you think this baby's going to be born soon? Like, (laughs) and, uh, she's, she says, so you have something in the way, either it's a cervical lift or your bladder's full. Something is in the way. Why don't you try Why don't you get out of the tub, go sit on the toilet for a few contractions and try not to push, you know, so I'm like, okay, like in my head, I'm like, I do not want to be, this is the last thing we'll be doing is climbing over the edge of this tub and like waddling to this toilet, you know? Um, so I do, I'm sitting on the toilet. They're telling me not to push. And at this point it is instinctual. I'm not trying to, it's just happening, you know? And so I'm like, I can't, I can't not push. I can't not push. And so I guess I should say like from where I'm saying now until he comes out is about four minutes. So this is a very fast paced story, what I'm saying here. So I'm on the toilet. I have a few contractions. I stand up. I'm just listening to my body at this point. I stand up and I'm not exaggerating when I say his head just fell out of me. Okay. So I'm standing in front of the toilet. His head just is hanging there from me and his shoulders were stuck. So my husband's outside of the toilet room and, um, they're like, do you want to get back in the tub? And I'm like, no, we're way past the tub, you know, at this point. So I waddle out, I get in a lunge. Um, the midwife does something to unhook his shoulder. I had to have like one more push, I think maybe. And, and he slides out. So it was, it definitely felt like much less work as far as getting him out that time. Um, Cora was a little, a little more challenging, um, but it, I think it was positional in hindsight it was definitely positional with her is why it was, was a little more difficult. Cause with him, I was standing, you know, and he just, just fell right out. So <clears throat> like I said, I didn't know he was a boy. I wanted a boy so bad. I didn't check cause I had a girl and I, I wanted a boy cause we don't want a lot of kids. And so I was like, I don't want to be pregnant again in my life. I want the second kid to be a boy and then I want to be done, but I didn't know. And so my, um, my mental way to cope with that was like, I'm going to hope it's a boy the whole time I'm pregnant. And when I birth, if it's a girl, I have those endorphins, right. That will like make me be excited and I'll have this little girl to love and everything will be fine. But the whole time I was like, I hope it's a boy. I hope it's a boy. So I'm in this lunge position. The midwife is reaching through and kind of catches him behind me. Right. And I can't believe I remember this, but in the moment, you know, I come, I kind of like come up on my knees and I'm like, don't hand me the baby. I want to reach for the baby. It was important to me for, for the baby, I guess, to experience, experience me reaching for them. I don't know why exactly. I must've heard that somewhere. So I sit back, she flips the baby over. My husband sees that it's a boy and he's like, Oh, you know, Oh man. And I see, and I just start screaming celebration. Like I had just won the Super Bowl, like expletives that should not be shared on this family friendly podcast, right? Before I even picked him up, he's just laying there, right? And I'm just like screaming, yes, yes, yes. So I finally pick him up and um, it was just the best feeling, like the best feeling, sense of relief. It was so great. I'm on the floor. So 
I think it's cool that I had a water birth and a land birth because I was, I was also talking about fear. I was also kind of afraid to do it on land because I thought it would hurt more, you know, and it didn't hurt more, but it was definitely way more messy, just blood and stuff everywhere. But, um, so his shoulders were stuck. I did. I don't think I technically hemorrhaged like whatever CCs a hemorrhage is. I don't think I technically did that. Um, but I did bleed a lot, not a lot, but more enough to where even in like that, the next hour or so, I was very, very thankful that I got my iron up <laughs> because if I hadn't, I probably would have fainted. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a little bit. And so then we wait, you know, placenta comes out, uh, just fine. I had a, I had a really short cord the first time and a really long cord the second time. So I think that's cool too. And then, yeah, I moved to the bed and I did have to get four stitches, which I didn't have the, the first time at all. Um, so yeah, he, he had a very excited entrance. Both of them, I think had very excited welcome, you know, like welcomes into the world, but his was just a little more <laughs> aggressive, I guess. Like her, I was kind of crying and happy and like, oh my gosh, this is so funny. And with him, you know, I'm like, yes, like pumping my fist in the air. So excited that, that he was here. So yeah, very, very different. Um, but his was, his was a good one for sure. A lot shorter, um, a lot shorter and less, less intense, but an interesting birth, you know, actually out of the, through the canal was a little bit different. Yeah. No, that's really neat. I actually like how you were contrasting back and forth so that women can hear, you know, things are different and it's totally normal. Like you, and both births were beautiful and both were, were great and at home. And like, it, it didn't have to be this big drastic thing. It's just the reality of it is the labor can be different and the experience can be different. And like how you birth your baby, all of that, it's it just never is exactly the same, you know? So, um, that's just the reality of it. That's it wonderful is, though. And, well, I think that, um, I do think that how a baby's born is significant for their life. So as the mother and like, as the pregnant woman, you can plan and plan and plan all you want. Like if I had really committed, I want to have this baby in water, you know, like I really want to do that. And that's important. I, he wasn't supposed to be, he was supposed to be, you know, on the floor. He was supposed to be on land or however you want to think of it. Um, and so there is a, I, I do think giving the baby some say in how they're born, you know, just in your mind, a little autonomy there is going to go a long way as far as taking the pressure off of you and like mm -hmm. all these decisions you have to make, you know, um, they, you know, they have, they have their own idea of how they want to want to come in. And that might be a little out there, but that is what I believe. So, <laughs> so you know, it's the same reason that I tell women that reach out and they're like, my baby is breech. And it's like, okay, like here's all the things that we can do to try to get that baby to turn. And here's all the positive reasons to doing that. And if those things don't work, trust your baby because there's probably a reason that they're sticking it out that way. If you do all the things and that's not the story. So and that's just one example. But no, I do believe that babies are born the way that they're born. I actually believe the people that end up in our birth space are there's a reason for it, good and bad. I think a lot of that um there's a spiritual side to birth and it's a very sacred place. And there's a lot of things that we have control over and a lot of things that we don't see um, that are involved and Anyways, it's I mean, until you've been in that space, whether as a birthing woman or somebody supporting a birthing woman in that space, there's no way to describe everything that's going on. And even even as I try now, you know, it's not doing it justice. There's a different world there. So, right. No, there's right. yeah, there's a there's a big space for that. It's just if anyone's listening, because I'm a very type A person, like I just described all these things I was doing during my pregnancy with my nutrition and stuff. And like, if you tell me this is going to help, then I'm going to do it, you know, and so. Um, I can be like slightly rigid when it comes to controlling an outcome, you know? Oh, totally. <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time, it is, it does take a little of, it takes a little of the, it should ease up. It should give you some peace about, you can try to control it, but what is going to happen is what is supposed to happen. Like, even if it doesn't quote, like work how you want it to everything happens like for a reason. I know that's like very cliche, but especially in the birth yeah. space, it's like everything goes the way that it needs to. Um, like me switching my midwife, like that didn't make any sense. It wasn't financially smart, you know, 
but like I did it and thank God, um, thank God I did. And talking about women, you know, the people in your birth space, I'm just going to say this in case anybody else has a relationship like this. The first time I said, nobody supported me in my home birth, right? My mom didn't. And I told her she wasn't allowed in the birth space because she was going to bring too much fear with her. And I was like, no, like we can't have fear around this. And I told her she wasn't coming and she was like, whatever. And she didn't really care because her birth was so different. You know, anybody who's had like a birth experience where it's like, oh, a room full of women and everybody's like, there's so much love and community. I didn't, I mean, she didn't know that. I, I didn't know that either. So we weren't missing out on that or whatever. Um, <laughs> it didn't matter because it, everything, we didn't even tell anyone we had the baby until after Cora came, uh, until after the first one was out. It was, everything was just so, it was in the middle of the night. We were tired and exhausted and it was so fast, you know. Um, but the second time too, I do think that's important is, you know, who you have in your birth space. Don't, don't have somebody in there just because you feel like you have to, you know? Yeah. And um, you definitely don't want anybody who's going to like distract you in those, in those special moments. And you are very empowered. One more funny thing that happened during his birth when I was on the toilet and they were telling me not to push and try to relax. Right. And I'm like, I can't not push one of the midwife. There was another, there was two midwife students. I always had like a room full (laughs) during my birth. It was great. And, um, she comes in the toilet room and she's pretty close, you know, just like right squatting right in front of me. And she's trying to coach me through like a breathing, like breathe with me, you know, And I just look at her like eye contact and I'm like, no, like, no, that's not gonna work right now. Like, and she's like, okay. And just got out, you know, and afterwards, of course, I'm like, Amanda, I'm so sorry. I was so rude about the breathing exercise. And she's like, no, don't worry about it. So it is like a different kind of world. And if you let yourself, it is a very, it's like a very authentic space where you don't really care if you offend somebody, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so that was another kind of funny, a funny interaction. Okay. Too. Before we jump off, um, cause I know I've had you for a little bit and I really appreciate your time, but I do like to end with like your best advice for, um, per- for birth partners and your best advice for moms. Like if you could sum it up into one sentence each, like what would that look like? So for birth partners, it would be to both like have faith in the birthing woman but also give her space. So, so you want to simultaneously like encourage her that she knows what she's doing. Her body knows how to do this. Right. But also like giving her space to, to be like my husband, if he would have been like, Oh, it's a bad decision to switch midwives, like because of the money or whatever, you know, then everything would have gone very different, but he trusted me and he was like, okay, like whatever you need, you know, so give them the room and the space to like be this, this birthing person that they're, that they're going to be. And then for pregnant women, I mean, ah, gosh, don't be afraid, decide not to be afraid, I guess, or, or, but don't try to control the fear, like be with the fear, I guess, just don't let it, don't let it control you either. And nutrition, nutrition is a big one. It's like eat your organs and uh, eat your collagen and, you know, don't skimp on the, on the good stuff when you're pregnant makes a big difference. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you, Martha. Thank you for being here with me today and for sharing this story for everyone who is going to be blessed by listening to it. Yes, I hope. I hope somebody likes it. Thank you so much. If you loved what you heard today, the very best way to support this podcast and help other moms to find it is to leave a quick review. I read one at the beginning of the episodes and I would love for yours to be next. And if you're ready for even more pregnancy, birth, and postpartum goodness, come join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com, where I will hold your hand and walk you through pregnancy and birth step-by-step so you're totally prepared for a birth you'll love. See you next week.